What's up, Warriors, and welcome to another episode of the Mental Health Movement Podcast, Voice for the Voiceless. I am your host, Chris. Um, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster these last couple of weeks. I just kind of took a break uh, since I've been doing nothing but grinding and uh, doing podcasts since I came back from vacation in North Carolina. Um, yeah, I've been networking with people. I have uh, actually had a meeting with my job about um, possibly doing a podcast that would be gl- on a global uh, status. So I'm pretty excited for that. Um, has some amazing guests uh, lined up. Uh, I'm still trying to get more people on. And uh, by the time this episode comes out, it will be for men's mental health. So I'm going to read a quick quote before I bring in today's guest, um, just because I feel like this is one of those subjects I have uh, probably drilled into uh, the format of my podcast every single time they come out. So I just want to give a shout out to all the men going through a lot with no one to turn to because this world wrongly taught men to mask their emotions. And, you know, for me, um, you know, you guys know my story by now. And it's it's to a point where society still feels the need to tell guys to man up, tell them not to show their emotions, tell them that, uh, you know, being a man is the right thing opposed to, you know, showing that you're a human being with emotions. Um, with that being said, uh, about a year ago, I had recorded with a gentleman um, by the name of Matt. We did a podcast uh, talking about his journey, his healing journey, um, and everything that he's gone through. Um, we got together and wanted to record another one for, uh, you know, a year since our last episode. Um, so again, please help me re-welcome uh, Matt Cameron, who is also the po- the host of Matty C Sports uh, Podcast. Matt, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. How are you? Doing good, man. Um, I I just want to uh, thank you again for uh, coming on the podcast. Um, I felt like our last session together was really good. And, um, you know, I just want to hear your progression um, since we, we talked last, you know, uh, starting with the obvious, you know, how's, how's the podcast going for you? Um, you know, are you finding positive strides are you finding your your niche and your audience uh you know how's how's it going for you uh uh, can i turn my camera yeah yeah (laughs) okay um my podcast is going well um still haven't had any problems with any guests um you know uh i've been in the mma world and the boxing world right now um i did take a break for like two weeks just because you know like i've t- like we discussed earlier um mental health happens every day it's not it never it doesn't go away um you have good days and bad just like any normal person some are more intense but other than that the podcast was great um and, and nothing but happiness with that so i think i had so with you and then the next day that'll be three people in in three days so can't complain. Yeah, those those back to back days definitely get uh it takes a lot out of you, man. <laughs> you know, um I always say to to people that follow me or anybody in my immediate circle that you know, I don't think people appreciate um nearly as much as you and I do or any other podcast for that matter of uh, how much we put into our communities, you know, and especially mental health communities. You know, mm-hmm. obviously I'm not saying my podcast more important than yours by any means but um by what i mean is you know it's so hard to push that message of everybody's mental health should matter as much as the next person it shouldn't be this community is more important than that this community is more important than that you know and that's how i feel like social media as a whole kind of plays sides with people it's you know men's mental health matters no women's mental health matters oh well one side can't matter without the other and i'm just sitting here like why can't we all just matter (laughs) you know what i mean yeah yeah uh, yeah it's it's exhausting at times um like i like i said at the beginning um i took a two-week break because i was just non-stop trying to put out content just to make sure i'm on top of it not falling behind and i was telling my buddy sean um that I just I hit a wall like really hard and Mm. I wasn't networking with people as much as I was when I first got back to Florida 
Um, and I was just like, I don't know what to do. And I'm trying so hard to build this brand, to build the podcast, to build the the Facebook group and everything. And it, it gets hard, man. It, it really does. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for you, you know, like you said, um, mental health struggles are not just when we pick and choose to have them. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah. It's every day, whether it's when we wake up, our problems are there to meet us right when we wake up or for us overthinkers. Um, it's there when you try to go to sleep. And I, I wish that was something a lot more people understood because I feel like people will just throw around the word depressed and say, oh, well, I'm depressed, you know, and people mistaken the word depressed and sad because I feel like they're two completely different things. I can sit here and smile the whole time and tell you that I'm not depressed, but you and I know that's not the case. Depression looks so many different ways. Sad is mm-hmm. sad. You know what I mean? I agree with you, man. I mean, honestly, like what I agree with you with the depression thing. If you're truly and honestly depressed or you have anxiety or bipolar or whatever you're not throwing it in the air like you're not like well i'm depressed like you said you can put on that happy face all you want right it, you're you're depressed and you know i mean you could tell like your girlfriend your wife what partner whatever you can tell them because they know but if it comes down to the nitty-gritty like that's now a focused word where it's like it's almost it's like, lost. It's of like I don't. It's kind of to the case where it's like I don't feel good. It's now a new thing. Like I'm depressed. Yep. Well, if you really are, it, like there's steps to this shit. Like it, it's like, okay, so you feel depressed? Okay, go see somebody. Okay, go do this and go do that. It's like a it's like a five step plan. It's 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 a lot, and um, it's a lot of, like you said, you, you hit a wall and I understand that. And I did too, in my two weeks as well. And, um, actually this morning I woke up and I forgot to take my night medicine and I felt it for that. When I first woke up, like, I was like, I don't feel right. So I looked and I didn't take it. Then I took, then I took my morning dose and I was, I I was a little bit shaky for like an hour or so. And then I was back, back to where I needed to be. Right. But like, people don't understand, like, Hey, like, don't use that word and just throw it out there. Use it yeah. to what it really is. And um, there was a thing that happened Friday. I work for a school. So a kid said something to a girl and he said, why don't you just go and kill yourself? And I said, hey, Jesus. hey, I said, hey. Don't ever use those words in front of me again, first of all. And second of all, that's a very, that's a very serious thing to say. So you need to watch your words because especially you could have hurt that girl's feelings. Yeah. And yeah. especially high school kids. They, they, they may not think that that's a serious thing, but it is, especially with teenage kids. There, it, It's a real problem in schools. Right. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was recording with uh, one of my guests, Reese, you know, I was, uh, I read statistics that NAMI, you know, they update the numbers on, you know, suicide rate and, you know, just like the number one, number two killer in, you know, whatever age group. And the number two cause of death for ages 10 to 14 is suicide. Wow. That turns my stomach. It does. Yeah. Now that you told me that. and, And the fact that we have kids just, you know, casually saying that. And obviously they're kids, you know, they hear what they hear from adults, the people that are supposed to be their role models and stuff. Right. And shit, even, even some of these movies and cartoons say crazy shit like that and are just Mm -hmm. so emotionally unaware of the damage that they can cause. Like I have, I'm not going to lie to you and say that I've never said, Oh, I'm going to kill myself, you know, not meaning it the way that, you know, it's meant to be. Um, but that's also a coping mechanism for me, you know, as like, you know, that dark humor. And obviously it's a very serious uh, matter and it's not something that should be just casually thrown around like that. Um, but I just, I wish that there was a system with these kids and with these parents that you could just sit them down and like, Hey, like this is becoming a big problem. Like 
there shouldn't be kids just casually telling other kids to kill themselves. Like that's Mm -hmm. just not okay. And I feel like we're in an age where most parents, well, I don't want to say most, some parents, like a handful of parents will use electronics to babysit their kids. They're not raising their kids. They're, they're just, they buy them a tablet and, you know, go be happy on on your damn tablet. And I I wish more than anything, uh, kids kind of grew up the way we did, you know, everything was learned the hard way, you know, obviously, I, I don't condone abuse and anything like I went through, but I, I I just wish that there was more discipline in the households or, or a two parent household in most of these kids homes, because I feel like, the, uh, again, that's another thing. Uh, it's very, very normalized to have a one per one parent household now. And I absolutely hate that for kids. Absolutely. And if you're missing the motherly side, like, you know, the normalcy thing, I say normalcy, you need, you have the loving mother and then you also have the dad who is supposed to be the, you know, the, the disciplinarian or the, you know, stuff like that. But when you take one out of the picture, it's like, well, shit, like sometimes I can do what I want and sometimes this and that. But I, I agree with you with the tablet thing too. I mean, my daughter has one but she's not on it for three, three, four hours just to, so you can, so you can sit down and be on your phone and, right. and chill with that. See in our day, like you and I, we didn't have that shit. We didn't have tablets. We didn't have these things. And I'm well, sure. They're, they're, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had Segas and stuff, <laughs> um, but we didn't like, we didn't have that stuff. And, you know, these kids are doing some really messed up things. Social media um, is a killer for these kids. And especially, you know, it's not even kids are picking on each other anymore in person. They're doing it on their phones. Yeah. Cyberbullying is really bad, man. I, I don't think I've ever experienced anything quite like cyberbullying. Um, right. I've had my family targeted. I've had my late brother targeted. Um, it's it's insane on the internet. And oh, yeah. it's one of those things where, yeah, you gotta have uh you gotta have thick skin, but at the same time, it's like you gotta be really, really careful with what communities you you involve yourself in. Like the people that I've gotten targeted by uh are wrestling fans and they're vicious, man. Um and I've heard the same about NBA fans. I've heard the same about NFL fans. Like sports fans are part of my French fucking insane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, hockey is a big one for me. Yeah. Not even MMA. I posted something. I want to say two years ago, and the topic line of what my thing said, they're like, "Well, I disagree. This guy was way better. What the fuck were you thinking?" And it's like, bro. It's not your show. Have an opinion, bro. (laughs) If you give me more views, that view has like fifteen thousand views right now. Like, I don't, I don't care about the views, but like, if you want me to shut the comments off, I don't care. But it's not gonna bother me, like, bro. Like, this is this is a fun thing. Like, are you are you mad because you can't make content yourself? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. It's a, it's crazy to me that you know one of the biggest stigmas that. I have faced myself as a podcaster and mental health advocate is I'm not allowed to have an opinion about anything because I'm a mental health advocate. That's how I've been treated. Um, If I disagree on a wrestler's stance on something, if I don't like them as a person or like them as a character, whatever. Oh, you call yourself a mental health advocate, blah, 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 blah. It's like, bro, like I can have an opinion. I don't know if you guys realize this or not. Like I don't have to be a straight arrow 24 freaking seven i'm gonna have an opinion about things right am i gonna talk about controversial stuff probably not but i'm gonna speak my opinion on things i don't agree with right and that that's a problem with society now is you really got to watch what you say and it's unfortunate because you know the 50s and 60s they were somewhat racial the vietnam era i was gonna say very cutthroat very very bad um even up to at least the 90s um 
it wasn't until the late, I, I have to say it wasn't until the later 2000s that it started to get really, really bad. I want to say right when Twitter started coming around was when it got really bad because then everybody, you know, whether it was a politician or it was just some content creator, they would just insert their opinion and their opinion is automatically better than everybody else. You know, it's uh yeah. The, the people I have encountered on social media over the last couple of years are just fucking insane. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't know the answer to solving any of it because it, I feel like every day it gets worse. And, um, you know, back to our earlier conversation um, with the, the mental health terminology, all of those words get thrown around so hard they become buzzwords and they're losing their definition. Like how many times I've heard the word gaslight and just this year alone, I just learned this word last year. I, I didn't know what gaslighting was uh, until last year. And then ever all of a sudden everybody's using the damn word gaslighting. Um, I disagreed with somebody on a wrestling opinion they had and they're like, Oh, stop gaslighting me. I'm like, do you even know what that word means? Like, that's not gaslighting you, bro. Or the word narcissist. That's another fun one because everybody loves to use that word. Um, and uh, a conversation I had with my brother and his girlfriend when we were, when we were driving um, was about false allegations and you know how the system is like super hardcore on men when it comes to those the SA allegations. You know, obviously there are more cases that are reported that yeah the man did it and he's a scumbag, whatever, right? And it's not talked about enough when the false allegations are put out there. You know, the, the system is so against men and there's no consequences for the other side that you have guys coming out 14 years in prison for something they didn't do because the woman owned up to it. Or like that football player. Uh, was he a football player? Uh, I don't remember his name, but he was dealing with allegations for two years just to find a public conversation that the girl who accused him um was saying that she's gonna get that bag and she's gonna um make sure that he uh gets in trouble for sa even if he didn't touch her or anything like that and it's just the mentality of today's society is i hate saying the word crazy you know it it doesn't seem like it's gonna get any better but guys like you and i or guys like sean caitlin judy whoever um it's so hard getting that message out there, man, that there are people fighting to get rid of this stigma around this damn community, man. But every day I feel like that battle gets harder. And it does. And I mean, I'll, I'll use this as an example because I think it's terrible. I, I, I will say I've seen Britney Spears and her new shit that she's doing. Very, very troublesome to me yeah. because you're looking at it at a mental health standpoint and everybody's like, oh my God, like she's playing with knives and shit. And like, listen, she has problems. Absolutely. It's not the crush Britney Spears that we all remember, like with the high school and all fun and games and stuff like that. Now it's like, she looks like demonic. Yeah. I, I want to say like, it, it's like, what it like she was so scarred from her parent or especially her dad and you know people don't understand like they think it's a joke and it's like she's trying to better herself but do you ever see a picture with her with her her kids do you ever see a picture with her and her boyfriend right. no you see her doing this crazy ass dancing and bullshit like by all means i really do think i hope she gets help but that's just one prime example of the society looking at it as a joke instead of under a a microscope bro like everything that she does it's all over the internet and you know i don't know enough about the situation with her and her dad to really make an opinion on the matter but um i i just feel like ever since that whole thing you know was resolved or whatever between her and her dad i feel like she just went off the rails um oh yeah Mm -hmm. so i don't know if he was right i don't know if she was right about the situation i don't know like i said i don't have an opinion on the matter um yes we grew up with her uh she was a lot of crushes for a lot of young men um Mm -hmm. 
And I, I just feel like it's one of those things that I don't care to look enough into just for the fact that, right. again, we're going, we're going, we're talking about the fan base conversation. That fan base is so toxic that you say one wrong word. It's like, oh my God, you're this, this, and this. I'm like, bro, I don't understand why you guys get upset. Like, we're just offering our opinion just like you are. Whether you would disagree with it or not, that's up to you. But it shouldn't come down to name calling. It shouldn't come down to doxing somebody off the internet or targeting somebody's family. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's it's just one of those situations, man, where if you don't know enough about it, not to comment on. And her situation, I don't know who's in the right. I don't know if her dad was in the right. Yeah, I, but, how off the yeah. rails she is. Um, and it's it's. I agree with you, man. I hope she gets the help, <clears throat> the help that she deserves. Cause uh, it's definitely worrisome to see how, how crazy uh, the internet is about how, the things that she's doing. And again, that's our problem. Like if you, if you look back in her heyday around that time, again, no Twitter, no Facebook, no nothing. Uh, maybe MySpace. I don't remember. I think MySpace um, came around like 2006, something like that. Yeah. So um, with her, it's like, again, I don't know the whole situation either, but um, my last thing about it is like, man, just get help, girl. Like, that's what I'm saying. And you don't have to go through your dad. You don't like you can do it yourself or maybe your spouse or ex can help you like whatever. But it's not just her. It's all people around now. But yep. like to really find out if Britney Spears had something wrong back in the day, you had to get the old newspaper. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then TMZ came around and that whole dynamic changed everything and how we get celebrity news. Um, it's heartbreaking stuff, man. Um, so let's let's get um, let's jump back a little bit into uh, into your journey here. So. <clears throat> Since we talked last, you know, we you told your story and the trials and tribulations and stuff that you've gone through, right? Um, and you had messaged me the other day asking me about therapy. Um, and I think it's important to bring up this conversation in every podcast because I think, and I, I'm pr- pretty sure you do too, uh, how important therapy is and how impactful it can be. Um, like we mentioned uh, before we started recording. We both experienced outpatient therapy. Um, I, how old were you when you uh, when you did your outpatient therapy again? Um, geez, um, actually, I was I, exactly thirty. Okay, um, so I was about fourteen, and I got paired up with a counselor who uh, only dealt with gambling um, addiction. So I don't really understand why I was paired up with her because it was after a suicide attempt and it's one of those things where it it puts that that really bad uh mindset uh in in, into your being that you know all therapy looks like this they're not going to help me they just want to give me medication they just you know they they don't want to help me they're not looking out for my best interest and that was me for the longest time because of uh my mom wanted me to go to therapy when I was younger. Um, and while she may have had good intentions, the person it was coming from, it didn't come off that way, you know, cause mm-hmm. most of, if not all my trauma has come from her and for her to sit there and tell me when I was a minor that, uh, you know, I should go to therapy. Uh, what's to say that she wouldn't, you know, uh, bullshit everything to the therapist that was talking to me at the time. And, uh, you know, sit there and tell me that I have problems that I don't and put me on medication that I don't want to be on. You know what I mean? And um, again, I myself am not for medication. I, I don't believe in it, but there are some people that need it. Absolutely. Um, so how has therapy benefited you? And, you know, I guess just as a man, do you think that therapy has changed your life? So <clears throat> I... I've been in and out of therapy since I was 13 years old. My mother said I had an anger issue and I did. I was punching walls. I was doing stupid shit like that. 
that's where the journey started. I had a really, really good one and he retired. And I always was chasing that dream that I would find that therapist. And it, for a very long time, it didn't happen until my recent one that's been great since. So that's five years I've been with this therapist, five years, which is very hard to find. Absolutely. Um, therapy has been a, a blessing in disguise. And um, for myself, I would recommend it. And I said it in our last talk was don't try to go for the first one. You may need to go through seven or maybe two or you, you might get lucky. But um, it's been a savior. Some, but I will say to people, like, there's different type of therapists. And, you know, there's ones that are going to really not test you, but really go to your inner self to right. where you you're in the present. But unexpectedly, you found a moment in time that you didn't even know that was bothering you until that point that could have contributed to that. And it's very, it's very, it, it, it's very intense sometimes. And you could get maybe into tears or whatever. And, but it's worth it. It, it gets all the demons and all the bullshit out of you. It really helps a lot. And for people that say, Oh, well, I don't need that. Like, maybe you don't like, that's fine. But for me, it helps. And if I could, I absolutely 100% recommend therapy to whatever you're going through, or, um, you know, it could be for any type of thing. And, you know, usually they're about 45 minutes to an hour. If you can't take 45 minutes to an hour just to talk to somebody to help you, then, you know, it, again, that's on you, but that hour or 45 minutes for two, every two weeks, helps me tremendously it right. helped me through my my two weeks that happened to me yeah and you know uh, i think there there's a lot of so there's a lot there that you said that i a hundred probably a thousand percent agree with man um one of the most important points you made is sometimes the first therapist you find isn't going to be the one for you right um mm -hmm. i have had a total of three therapists in my life and the one i had in jersey was great um, but unfortunately I left New Jersey because of circumstances up there with my mom. Um, then I came back down to Florida and I found a therapist that one of my friends had recommended the clinic. She didn't write anything down. Um, she didn't help me through my first panic attack, nothing. Um, the second session we had, she asked me, she's like, Oh, would you take medication? Like it was just kind of, it came off as one of those things where if, she gets me medication, then she'll get paid. And it's one of those yeah, things where it's it, like, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of doctors like that. There's a lot of physicians, therapists, and it, it's so disheartening because that was almost a soul crushing experience for me because I had such a good experience in Jersey. Right. And coming back down to Florida, I was like, okay, I'm ready to go to therapy again. Therapy was amazing to me. And I had that experience and I almost completely gave up on myself, man. And the second, th uh, my second therapist that I have now, or third therapist, technically, I guess, um, I've been with her for three years. And prior to finding her, you know, uh, NAMI, which is the National Alliance on uh, Mental Illness Foundation, um, they had a representative come in and you know, talk about therapy and talk about mental health and stuff. This is around the time when I first uh, um, was with the company. And I'm like, okay, this, this is going to be really good. Um, I, I'm going to ask him questions. And I waited until after um, the meeting and everything. Cause you know, as a guy, it, it's weird to put your, put the spotlight on yourself when it comes to stuff mm -hmm. like that. Cause that's yeah. stigma in society for men. Um, and I asked him like, Hey man, like I had a really bad experience with a therapist and I know I need to go back. Like I was going through some of the worst possible times that I could go through at the time. I mean, this is like just before the pandemic. Um, and he's like, you know, all you have to do is, you know, when you're looking for a therapist, you know, and you have that conversation with them about setting up a meeting, you ask them questions. What kind of therapy do they cover? Uh, do they have a sliding scale? Um, do they offer medication you know simple questions like that and like you said it could take seven tries to find that perfect therapist and mm -hmm. right before i found jess i had lost two people one 
uh, that was really, well, both of them are really important to me, but one that was really close to my heart, Amy, uh, had passed away in July. And then the day before I started therapy, I lost a friend who was a coworker, uh, who was absolutely one of the most outstanding human beings to me that I've ever met. Um, and she passed away the day before I was going to start therapy. So I, I was a wreck and this is right in the middle of the pandemic. So we couldn't do fate. We couldn't do person to person like I was used to, you know, uh, and I was very unsure about how therapy would be going to be. I was so down on myself about it. I'm like, man, this isn't going to work out because I, I'm more of a, I need somebody here and have a conversation with, you know, face to face, you know, I'm not going to feel any emotion or anything like that. She made me feel more comfortable than anybody has that I've ever met in my life. Our first session, you know, I cried my eyes out about Amy and, and Lynn and, you know, up until now, man, I, I've made so much progress uh, since I first met Jess, you know, I, I started the podcast. I, uh, about to go on a podcast for the company that I work in to talk about men's mental health, you know, things like that. And guys, for, for all the listeners, man, this is just a little bit of what therapy can do for you. You know, you, you've heard it from Matt. You've heard it from myself. Therapy is the greatest experience that I've ever had in my entire life, you know, and that, that goes for anything I've done. Um, the thing about therapy too, you have to be willing to do the work. It's not, mm -hmm. therapy is not just for you to, to vent. It is for that, but it's not just for that. You have to be willing to, like you said, challenge yourself and look inside yourself and be like, okay, I could do this differently and I could do this differently and honor my boundaries. What's that honor my inner child? What's that therapy teaches you all those things. And man, I've helped people find therapists and they say every day, how great the therapy sessions are going. And like yourself, you know, you've been with your therapist for five years. Um, and, and I feel like it's really hard to find genuine people in this community that are willing to hundred percent stick by their clients and and support them as hardcore as they do man and i'm i'm more than happy to hear that another man um is in therapy and has been for that long man because it's not talked about nearly enough how important therapists are to this society and it's true i mean you, you know i could have gave up on on it a long time ago after well this was when i was leading up to getting sick you know, this guy, his first thing was he wanted me to sign the um, um you know, the thing, the the call the call people up like oh, okay. um mandatory um reporter. Okay. And I was like, You're giving me this paper the first time you meet me? Like I thought that was bullshit. Then there was a lady I had for one session. And the, I said, oh, yeah, I have this. And then she looked it up in a medical dictionary and she says, yep, you have that. I was like, all right, so you're gone. <laughs> like, it was a crazy you a dictionary, a medical dictionary and says, oh, yeah, um, the definition. Yes, you you have depression. I'm like, see you the fuck later. Like, <laughs> like what? Uh, I was like, oh my god. That is the god. craziest shit I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, it was it was nuts. It was insane. I was like, lady, I'm done with you. Like, <laughs> this has been the worst. Then I saw her grocery shopping. The next time I saw her, she was grocery shopping. She didn't even know the fuck I was. And I was like, yeah, you're a great therapist. So after that, like I took a break for a while and then I got sick. And um um then I found this one five years and the trust is the most important thing. Yeah. Like you said, the work is very important. If you're not willing to work and, you know, treat it as, you know, and there's a stigma about it. Like if, if you go to a therapist, you're weak. No, nah, not, not even the all. case at all. Right. You you're stronger for bettering yourself. For me in the present, like, I wouldn't be able to take care of my daughter if I didn't have the, the, I have, I I'm, I'm blessed because I have pretty much all the tools I need to get to where I need to be, but you have to work. And 
you know, and I realized, and this is a crazy thing. This kind of hit me at a, actually this happened at a session where it's like, you know what, like this is a mental health issue. And then this is life. Something happens to you in life. It's life. Like, um, for the example, like you get in a I've fight. Heard is, uh, life happens for you, not to you. I agree with that a hundred percent. And you know, like life, like if you get in a fight with somebody, that's life. If you get mad at them after, that's life. But if you're if you're on the line of like, oh, I'm having a mental breakdown or my like your anxiety's through the roof, or that could be a mental health thing. But um yeah, man, I mean it, it's you learn as you go, but you gotta put in the work. Absolutely, man. Um, so let me ask you ask you this, because I know everybody took the pandemic differently. How was therapy for you during the pandemic? Um, was it more or less the well, same or was it really challenging because of just how hard scheduling was or how hard it was just to see somebody face to face if that was even a possibility? Um, you know, talk about those challenges if you had any. So as crazy as it sounds, the pandemic did not bother me as, as something like the, like for me, it's like, like my, actually my, one of my parents said, well, I don't get how you're dealing with this right now. And I'm like, it's here. Like it's something that's happening. But as I diverse, um, with my therapist, um, I'm lucky. She always has, she always has time for me always. And it was through this, it was through zoom, our 45 minute sessions or an hour. And it was great because I still had that help. Right. I was fortunate. Some, I heard some therapist said, Oh, well, I, I, I can't do this. Um, when the pandemic slows down, cause they didn't think to, Hey, we could go through Zoom. We could go through Skype. We could. So I was fortunate. I, I don't know about what what with you during that time. Yeah, and and that's you know that's one of the things I was I was talking about. You know, it was supposed to be a, a face to face interaction. You know, I was supposed to go to her office. Um, and this is right as the pandemic was. We're in the middle of it, and she, I believe, she was moving to Orlando, and then also just add the pandemic on top of that. So. It was one of those things I was unsure about because, you know, it's I feel the same way about text messages sometimes, man. It's just like you can't uh, you can't encapsulate how much emotion is in a face to face compared to what is in a text. message. hundred percent agree with that. And that's one of the reasons I didn't want to do a Zoom call or the the uh, the video chat that her and I do was because of that, because I'm such a socially interactive person. But when the pandemic hit, that completely changed. Like the social anxiety is now a thing. I've never had social anxiety in my entire life. Now, when I go to grocery stores, dude, I barely look up. Like I don't look at people. I don't talk to people in the grocery store. Like it's fucking weird. And I've always been a person to talk to strangers about shit. Like, you know, if if I'm going to see a sunset and be like, oh yeah, it's, it's a really nice sunset tonight. Right. And, you know, I, I've, even as a kid, I always made friends with people that I, I didn't know. And obviously that's, that's how we make friends. But, um, you know, what the pandemic, my first concert was awkward as fuck after the pandemic. First WrestleMania was awkward as fuck in the pandemic. Like, um, being around so many people now it's you don't know what people are capable of because all the craziness that's going on right now man mm -hmm. like you know they they passed that constitutional carry here in florida and you know people can have a gun on them without a concealed and while i don't disagree with it it's one of those things you got to have in the back of your head man if you bump into this person or you um you know uh, say the wrong thing or are they going to turn around and shoot you down? You know, I don't think it's going to happen like that. Cause I, I don't live in uh, a state where it's like that, but it's always in the back of your mind. It's, you don't know what people are capable of after this pandemic. And uh, when, uh, when I went to my first concert, um, 
I remember we were in the House of Blues in Orlando and it's only standing room. So I was sitting there standing for five hours in the same place, shoulder to shoulder around so many damn people. And we had to wear that House of Blues. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we had to wear a mask. And I'm like, bro, I cannot breathe. There are so many people around me and all this body heat and shit. And you have to wear a mask and I got a damn beard. Like it's, it was horrible. So I took it off for like five minutes just so I can breathe. And I look around, everybody's still wearing a mask and I started freaking out a little bit. I'm like, fuck, is the media getting in my head? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to die? You know, it's those little things that the media pedals and that social media pedals is, oh, you're going to go to the grocery store and you're going to die because of COVID. You know, it's, it's, I don't get sick. And I, and I, the only time I ever get sick is because of allergies. I don't get sick. I didn't get COVID, knock on wood. I, you know, I don't really get colds, but it's one of those things that the things that are peddled on the media and the things that are peddled on social media, man, it's, it gets in your head sometimes and you don't realize it until you're in a social setting where it's like, shit, this person's coughing. Do they have COVID? You know what I mean? I think the biggest problem during the pandemic that really fucked everybody up and a lot of people were at home and all that shit, the liquor stores were still fucking open. (laughs) All of them. So if you didn't have anxiety or depression, then you were drinking that shit. You were drinking anxiety and depression. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) that and grocery stores, man. And uh, for all, for all the worry. and, And I mean, the, the um the toilet paper scandal like it was just it was just a weird time and now it's like i i feel like there's still a bunker full of fucking toilet paper somewhere right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know it's it's crazy to me how politicians acted during that time and how grocery stores and corporations acted at that time because you know, we we had to literally readjust our our entire lives and our whole schedule and everything around working from home or homeschooling kids or whatever it was, and then all of a sudden we're supposed to just readjust outside of that mentality. And these corporations don't realize like you had us inside for three years, and now you expect all of a sudden to everybody to just comply and switch back over to everything and how it was. It doesn't work that way. Right. You know? Um, but yeah, man, it's the, the therapy thing, uh, it saved my life, you know, and of course there's obviously Same with me. work. Yeah. Same with me. And obviously it's the work that you and I did, man. Um and, and, and I think I may have asked you this in our first recording, and if if I didn't, but is your therapist a guy or a girl? A woman. So more comfortable you, with the woman. Okay, so it's not just me, right? Um I remember when I had a conversation with one of my friends when uh, I first started therapy. Oh, why don't you get a guy therapist? I'm like, bro, I don't want that silent judgment from another man who's a therapist. I don't trust 90% of the things that I'm internally battling to be spoken to a man. You know what I mean? And obviously Mm -hmm. you and I are friends, so it's not the same thing, but Right. You're talking to a professional who is a therapist, has an unbiased uh, uh, outlook on all the things you're going through. I I don't feel comfortable with the fact that uh, I'm I'm talking to another man because in the back of his mind, is he saying all the shit that was said to you as a kid? Like, oh, man up or oh, stop being a pussy. Stop this. Stop that. Um, And I know therapists don't talk to their clients like that, but it's the what we've been through growing up that completely deters me away from talking to a, a guy about this stuff. And, and I agree just because I had one at one time and, you know, you have, a, I had the same stigma, except it was roles reverse. I was like, how the fuck is this nerdy guy going to teach me how to do, like do all this shit. And then like he had his, <laughs> his leg crossed, like he was sitting at the beach and like writing this shit down. And I'm like, thank you feel <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, bro, like, I, I don't, I don't go for that. Like with right. a woman, it's just more comfortable. It's like, a, I don't want to say a motherly figure, but like they relate to what we're going through right. better than a man would. Cause I've, I've, I've dealt with both 
Mm-hmm. And the woman is more, and she is the greatest person ever, man. I tell you. And like, she's to the point where she's so nice. And I'm, I'm so privileged that and spoiled kind of that she, um, she texted me the day before and said, see you, see you tomorrow at 12. You know, like not a lot of therapists do that shit. Yeah, man. And with my therapist, you know, uh, she listens to my podcast actively. Like, she listens to every single episode and she gives me feedback on every single one. And it's not just like, it's not feedback where it's like, Oh, this was a great episode. It was, it's never that cut dry. It's always, I love that you talked about this. I think it's super important that you brought up this and then she'll talk about the guests too. And, you know, I've expressed to her how much her support means to me. And in, in a world or in a community where that support isn't very strong. And I, and, and I say this mm-hmm. because the social media algorithm for, for those of you who, are, who aren't aware of what I'm, what I'm speaking on, the social media algorithm for mental health is so low that nine times out of 10, you're not going to scroll past the mental health related thing on TikTok. You're nine times out of 10, not going to see it on Instagram. You sure as hell won't find it on Facebook because Facebook buries a lot of posts and, you know, you can Mm -hmm. post about this great accomplishment, this great thing that's going on in your life and it'll get one, two likes. The likes aren't important, but I just want to put this in perspective for you guys. Then you have somebody who will post a picture of their ass, you know, a gorgeous woman uh, with her ass hanging out or whatever, and it'll get 400 likes immediately. And that's not a dig on that woman, you know, flaunt what you got, you know, whatever. But the fact of the matter is mental health doesn't matter on a social media platform as much as it should. And it's so hard to make content for mental, for mental health communities because you put in so much work and it it, it kind of feels like you're beating your head against the wall. How many times do we have to see a, a woman bashing a man on social media and how many times are we going to see a man bashing a woman on social media and you can't respond because it's considered bullying or it's considered hateful speech when you're just telling it like it is, you know, and they allow hateful responses, but they don't, uh, they don't allow replies that can be passive. I I've had videos taken down uh, on my TikTok for, for hateful and bullying content because um you know, you're telling it like it is like there was a video. Mm-hmm. Um, 100%. There was a video of a woman shaming a man for being in a wheelchair because he asked her out on a date. She is sitting there saying, oh, show me that you can run. Show me that you can walk. And this man's just in public in a wheelchair. Wow. And, you know, she's just sitting there shaming him. And I responded to it. I'm like, you know, it, it makes me sick that people who are in her fr- uh, in her circle or whatever, don't take her out of that situation immediately because that man did not deserve it. And I, I, my video got taken down for bullying and I, I didn't bully her at all. I just said, I, I, I genuinely hope that that doesn't happen to her because that's fucked up. You, you don't say things like that to yeah. handicapped people. I'm sorry. And it got taken down and it's, you know, it's things like that, man. You, you can't talk about taboo subjects on, uh, on social media platforms without it getting taken down, man. Like if I were to make a video right now on TikTok about suicide awareness, nine times out of 10, it wouldn't reach your feed unless you followed me and have notifications on. And it's like that for Facebook. It's like that for Instagram. The algorithm is so damn small that it, it we're, we're fighting against a brick wall is what it is. And it's, it's the this- biggest the biggest problem is is everybody like in the social media world that did like somewhat the mental health or has this this feeling of mental health they all do the fucking and i don't have a problem but dr drew they think he's the fucking savior of everybody because he saved dr drew the guy who uh does love therapy and you know uh trauma all that stuff he had all these shows and shit Hmm. And then there's like yeah, Doctor Oz, like right. that, like the it. I'm just, like it's like uh he's like the Joe Rogan of like you know certain therapies and stuff like that, and 
it's a stigma. Like people will go off of his opinion, but you know, ordinary people like us, it's like, well, they're just spewing out stuff. It's like, right. no, if you really heard the fucking story, like you would, you would understand. And and this is nothing towards anybody who does like, um, you know, speeches at conferences or, you know, mental health uh, conferences or anything like that. But like, hear Chris's story, hear Matt's story, feel a genuine story of what we fucking went through, what we're dealing through now. See that and see what happens with your, with people. Not that I want to flaunt my story. It's just, I'm saying like, show it from real people. Yeah, man. And you know, that's the thing too, is it's so hard to be raw in, in a world that doesn't want to hear what you went through like yes everybody has their problems but we need to talk about those problems we don't just say oh well get over it everybody else has problems it doesn't work that way that's like Mm -hmm. saying you can't be happy because other people have it better than you and i I say that every single time people are like oh well at least it's not this i'm like that that doesn't make what i'm going through any less because it's not that and i feel like so many people are so comfortable with undermining people's struggles that when it comes to you know like you just said going to those conferences and telling our story we have to fluff things we can't talk about this we can't say this word and we we basically have to polish a polish a turd is what it comes down to and yeah you know uh when it comes to to this story um that i want to tell um, at my job, I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm going to tell every detail that I went through. You know, obviously I'm not going to be graphic and swear every five seconds in a work environment, but of course it's, it's going to be one of those, one of those things where I, I want people to understand what it was like growing up as a man in the nineties and early two thousands. Like, yeah, there are people in the world that have it a lot worse off than me. 100%. There are oh yeah sex trafficking mm-hmm. victims. There are people that I got physically abused every day of their life sexually abused so on and so forth but i went through my own trauma and inspired and not not inspired it manifested the trauma that i went through and all the healing that i've done in the last couple of years i've dug up so much shit that i didn't know was there and i i just i wish society would stop trying to push down people that are trying to speak up Absolutely. And there was one thing that happened a couple of months ago. I was trying to look for something up in my attic and um, it was my medical stuff that I thought was gone from when I was an inpatient. So looked at it for two seconds, saw what the name of the hospital was, saw the name, my name. And I said, fuck it, put it in a, um, in a fire pit outside and I burned that and I burned it and I was like yeah that gave me closure a little bit like sometimes you just gotta like move on and that was just a case where I was like immediately I was like screw this and it took a it it took a while to catch on fire because it rained the night before but (laughs) like but yeah I mean some people essentially it was like a little trigger right it definitely a hundred percent was a trigger. Even I even burned the folder, and the bur- the folder was hard to burn, man. And you know what I mean, like. But, but it was in a controlled thing, and I just I just lit it up, and that was yeah. it. That was and, it, and it was satisfying to me that I that part of my life is now away. Yeah. So with uh with last month being uh su- or well with September being suicide uh prevention month um when this episode airs it'll be in November and that's men's mental health month uh brings me to the question that I feel is one of the most important ones to ask what does men's mental health mean to you what does that month mean to you It is extremely important like I said this is an everyday thing there's months there's days that are celebrated for different things, but men's health is important every day and a month. Yeah, we can celebrate it, you know, and, you know, with, with men's health, it, women have their own issues. I, I'm i not saying that they don't go through stuff either because they go through a lot of shit too. 
but like you said about the word taboo the men's health mental health is taboo like they're like too ornery and like all right i'm i'm a man like i'm uh, like i don't need fucking therapy i don't need to go inpatient i don't need to go outpatient i don't need to do any of that i just live my life every day and you know but look at it this way try try you know crying every day because you don't know why try going to inpatient bettering yourself even though you went through hell withdraw through medications and better yourself go through the anxiety of being like you said like i'll tell the story about that too about you know with you having the social um anxiety in in the, the grocery store how you have your head down and stuff like that there was a point where i was in a target for five minutes and i had to sit down and breathe so um all that shit like I said, men, mental health, men's health, very important. It's, but it's, it's like everything we've talked about, Chris, with you got to do the work and don't give up. Like if you just, you're just going to stew, you want to be in a dark room right now. I'm in a, a bright room. You're going to watch TV. You're in, I don't know about you with, with your past experience. Like I know you love wrestling. I don't know if you were looking at wrestling at one point. It's a thing you love and you just stared at the TV and you, it was just people wa wrestling. Like you didn't even. That's how I felt. No, pandemic, man. Yeah. You had no, like you had no emotion. Just like me, like, you know, like I was watching stuff that like would make me laugh and I just look at it like it's just a thing on a TV screen. Right. Don't people don't need to stew. If you stew on it or you don't get help, your mental stage is going to be affected. You know, like I said, I've seen some horrible, horrible shit and impatient, but I got through it. So it's like every day you're going to get your own little accomplishment without even knowing it. And again, men's mental health is very important. And I really wish that people would take the initiative and you know i'm not saying this in a bad way but don't don't just like like when you still you're gonna you may have a plan of how you're gonna take mm -hmm. your life or you know you're gonna you're gonna hurt yourself or whatever the case may be you could prevent yourself from doing that whether i know you're not a medication person i am um just get the help you need there's yeah. so many numbers there's so many um hotlines there's so many tools that you can use now it, it's just the it's just the work you need to do i went through work that didn't fucking help me at all like like the outpatient we talk about i think we both hate that a lot <laughs> you know i think with outpatient therapy i don't see it ve being very beneficial and and the reason i say that is you know, you go in there and then you're out. It's it's not one of those things where you're staying and you have to face yourself in the mirror every single day like inpatient does. Outpatient therapy is you're going in, you can leave whenever the hell you want. I don't like that. If you're suicidal, if you're mentally unwell, you shouldn't be in an outpatient therapy. I, you It just doesn't, I don't see a benefit in outpatient therapy. Maybe it works for some people. And I just want to clarify on the medication uh conversation too it's not that i'm completely against medication i think my problem is there are way too many doctors and way too many therapists way too many psychiatrists that rely on prescribing medication opposed to actually trying I agree to help with them. that too and one of my that. one of my four, uh, one of my guests um sid says that you know uh, she feels like most doctors want to treat the uh, symptom and not the cause. And that's, that's my, I think that's my forever outlook on medication. Cause it's just like, yes, yeah, somebody, you know, some people may need medication just to get by because they're just, their brain doesn't produce what it needs to produce. And that's completely fine. But when you're trying to help somebody who just wants to better themselves and wants to put in the work to evolve their, their being and, shed all that toxic skin that they have on the first 
uh, initiative should not be, hey, I'm going to prescribe you this. It shouldn't be like that. And that's how this damn society is. And, you know, for anybody of my listeners that does take medication, if it helps you, I'm happy for you. I, I'm not going to say you don't need it, but I, I'm against it because of big pharma. I don't I don't like big pharma. I don't like how it's in everybody's pockets. And the sooner people realize that, I feel like we'll have a healthier society. You know, that's why, in my opinion, that's why cancer has never found a cure. There is way too much money being made in the cancer industry. You're going to tell me with all this technology, all this research and stuff that we don't have a cure to cancer? Bullshit. They just want money. That's all it is. And and my thing is, too, with um, with medication. And again, I have a good med prescriber. So, so with that, um, she gave me a blood test. This was before I went into um, inpatient. So what she, so what the blood test did was it listed every fucking medication there possibly is. I think we talked about this in the last show. And there was green green light type of thing. Not saying gaslight. So <laughs> green green light, yellow, and red. Green obviously means this is the best for you. Orange means man, it's okay, but it may have the side effects. Red means don't take it. And what does impatient do? Give me all the fucking red ones. So I agree with that. It's like that's what I feel bad about with people in inpatient is they need they different medication. Better. They yeah. don't know better. They're just like it's like a, a parent giving a kid M&Ms like, oh, here you go. This might help you. And you got guys that are paranoid schizophrenics and they're drinking fucking coffee. Yeah. You know, like it's all over the place. And, you know, the the medications are out of control for people that might need it for different reasons. Like, right. um, you know, I, I don't I don't like the big pharmas either. And I don't like how very serious diseases like can be cured but they're not just it's like it's not being disclosed and it's very upsetting to me as well and you know it is a cash is it is a cash um cash thing you know like yep. you can't tell me fucking pfizer made millions of dollars on that shit moderna made a shit ton of money i took it I, I took both shots and I still got co fucking COVID. So right. it's like, excuse my language, but. Oh, it's fine. You know, the, <laughs> I've dropped the, a couple of F-bombs. <laughs> it's, it's making me mad now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel um, you, man. And but they're making, they're making all this money and people are still getting COVID because uh, John Smith down the street has, has COVID. You walk by him, he gives you that breath. And then, you know, however it passes, you get COVID. So what were the shots for? I rest it's my a, case on that. Yeah, COVID's a, a tricky conversation, man. And again, it's one of those one of those topics that I don't talk about because people don't want to hear um what they uh, the opposite of what they believe. Um there's evidence on more of the shady end of of uh, how COVID went down, but you know, like I said, we don't we don't discuss it because there's no safe space to discuss how you feel about COVID, unfortunately. Um, and just anything else for that matter. Uh, you know, when I did this podcast, when I created the group, it was one of those things where I wanted to make sure that people can talk about their struggles and not have to worry about their family members judging them. Like when the group was first made, for example, it was public and, uh, you know, anybody could see it. And that was when I was still talking to my mom, uh, my dad could see anything that posted in there, whatever. And then somebody's like, you know, I think you would get more engagement if you made the, the the group private. And as soon as I did that, people were starting to post all the time, would talk about all their struggles and everything they were going through. And then Facebook added the anonymous uh, posting uh, feature in there, too. And out, probably one of the best features I've ever seen put on an app in my life, because I've seen more people post now than I saw when I first created the group in 2019. And and I see it and you're doing an amazing job for people. I've seen the different things. I, I haven't seen the anonymous stuff, but obviously, but the things you're saying to these people and doing for these people are, are just, um, I think it's amazing, man. And 
it's it's just good stuff and i see that men are coming on there and it's not just women and it's good stuff and it's good that you're putting out this content so they can physically see your face and talking to other talking to guests and you know maybe they relate to me maybe they relate to one of your other guests you know and maybe that can change their lives and that's what that's what i love about coming on here is there's no judge and there's it's just all um stuff that's important that people just don't don't think that um they don't think that other people are going through the same thing you are yeah yeah and you know that's one of the most important things about this podcast is I've had people message me saying that they're starting to take notes when they listen to my podcast or my podcast help them. And, you know, all in all, that's, that's really all I want to do, man, is help people. And sometimes I feel defeated because, you know, the Facebook algorithm will screw me over or uh, the podcast doesn't get as many listens as I'd like it to. Or uh, for example, when the Spotify uh, ambassadorship got taken away from me, like it's, it's there's a lot more defeating moments than there are uh great moments, but those great moments are tremendous. So it, it almost balances itself out. Um, but you know, like I said, man, I, I appreciate the fact that you stuck around for as long as you have, and you've supported me since, since we first met and both podcasts, uh, the last one and this one, I think uh, are some of the best conversations I've had because it's so hard to find people that are authentic, man. And it's even harder to find people that are willing to be raw and real with you when it comes to their story. So again, I I thank you for being willing to come on here and and share the vulnerable, vulnerable pieces of you as a man. Appreciate it, man. The same to you. And you're a guest on my show. Yeah, buddy. We'll have to put that on the link of your, uh, you you really impressed my producer with all your wrestling knowledge, man. It, it's absolutely crazy. You know, it's it's really funny. Um, a couple weeks ago, I think it might have been last week. Um, there was a storyline in uh in wrestling going on, and and I and I kind of wrote down how I thought it should be booked. Like it makes sense for it to go this direction. And somebody replied, "Wow, you should be a writer." I'm like, bro, I've just been watching since I was like seven years old. Like, I. I see things before they happen and, you know, sometimes predictability isn't the worst thing, but when you see things that could be really great, depending on how it's booked and depending on how it's written, it it always, my brain is always spinning, man, whether it's movie quotes that are churning out of my mouth or it's wrestling talk, it's always in motion, man. So um, tell your producer the next time we talk to him that I greatly appreciate that. Um, (laughs) I definitely will. (laughs) uh, I, that was one of my favorite podcasts I've done um, because it's wrestling is one of my biggest passions in life. So yeah, man. Um, So before we wrap up and before we get to my quote, um, I just have uh, one last question for you. Um, What is one important lesson that you try to teach your daughter uh, in terms of just life and her going through it? Well, so the big thing is, is clean up your toys and clean up your clothes and all that (laughs) stuff no but in life man just just have fun man just have fun and like when you go to school make friends like do all that fun stuff she's in kindergarten now so it's like you know she's she's in the early stages she's like oh i made a friend today i'm like oh that's awesome but it's like if you have kids anybody out there i'm sure with parents on here too Please don't let them just have them say, how is school? Good. That's bullshit. You want more info. Like, yeah. like you wish the teacher like had a synopsis of the day. And I'm like, <laughs> but uh, the biggest thing for my daughter is have fun, enjoy life. And just like, whatever I can do to be the best dad I can, I'm going to do. And And that's the greatest thing because- there were times in my life where I wasn't having fun and you don't want to say, Hey, your dad was fucking stupid when he was older. Hey, your dad, your, well, it will probably be, but you know, you didn't have the best relationship with your grandfather, but we made it all work. Now your grandfather loves you to death and treats you like, like it's your kid. So it's like, 
I love that part of it more than the struggles I had before. So right. I just wish her all the fun in the world. Well, yeah, she's man. going to Disney next month. She'll have fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I definitely think it's important for parents to be more engaged uh, in their kids' lives because for me, I didn't have that. Um, you know, it was always what it was always my mom looking for the next best relationship. Um, and it was always, uh, my dad and I never connected on any level. So, um, yeah, man, it's, it's great to hear that you stay engaged in your daughter's life. And I think those are really important lessons. Um, and for anybody listening, uh, please always try to stay engaged, uh, with your kids. Um, you know, obviously time goes really fast as we saw during the pandemic, um, and even more so now when your kids are younger. So, um, to anybody listening, uh, you know, like just to reiterate what Matt said, let your kids have fun and just be them, be their authentic selves. Um, and you know, just stay engaged, stay engaged with your kids, man. Um, but before we wrap up, you know, as you guys know, I like to read a quote, uh, based on whatever. And before, and before that, as parents, you have to be fun too. You yeah. can't show the emotions like with, um, you know, you and your wife just got in a fight. Let it fucking go then. Your kid is going to notice that. They might be resentful. They might, de- like, they might choose sides. Don't let that happen. Yeah. Have fun too. Couldn't agree more. Um, so as you guys know, I'd like to read a quote based on uh, whatever topic that I happen to be covering with my current guests. Um, today, I have a quote from Alex Karras, who is an athlete, um, and it reads, it takes more courage to reveal insecurities than to hide them, more strength to relate to people than to dominate them, more quote unquote manhood to abide by thought, uh, out principles rather than blind reflex. Toughness is in the soul and spirit, not in muscles and an immature mind. I thought that was one of the most powerful quotes I've ever read because, you know, working out, there's, there's an absolute benefit to working out, you know, physical health, mental health, you know, it it all goes hand in hand. Um, But if you're not taking care of your brain at the same time, you're, you're not going to have, you got to have that balance. And I'm trying every day to keep that balance and improve my diet, improve my workout habits. And it's, it's a challenge, man. It's, it goes, goes with the mental health struggles that we talked about um but before we wrap up here matt where can they uh where can everybody find you on your socials um so i'm on instagram i have two pages at maddie c23 maddie being m-a-t-t-i-e-c uh maddie c sports and then maddie 23 same thing and then um facebook matt cameron um yeah, that's, that, that's it. I don't what's know. Your, what's your one. podcast name for for our listeners? Oh, and um, my show is Maddie C Sports. It it show is most Sundays at six p.m. I usually post where when they are and who I'm with. And I also want to say one more thing to everybody out there too, that I learned from um, a person I interviewed a couple years ago was to live in the present the past is depression future is anxiety just live in the present and that's it i love that damn quote every time every time you say it man it's one of the best quotes i've ever heard um but again thank you again so much for for being on today matt um for all my listeners i know we're heading into the holiday season as well so you know make sure to to love each other and you know, take care of each other the best that we can. Um, Until next time, be well. And as always, be gentle with yourselves. Much love, guys.